Good morning, church. Samuel Pastor, good to see you back with us. So today I will be speaking on Christ-centered community. And we'll be going through Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. So just a quick little um, backstory on Galatians. Um, essentially, the Galatian churches were basically being taught that Jesus was not enough and that they needed to continue to keep the laws, uh, continue circumcision, and so on. So this was creating legalism and division amongst all the members. Um, and so that's when we'll hit. And so chapter 6 is um, obviously you know, the end of this book, end of this letter. Um, so, and the main point of it is bearing one another's burdens. So we're going to be going through that. So Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. So I thought I would do a quick little object lesson. So I'm going to call on a volunteer, or I guess I'm, I'm it's a voluntold, but I'm going to ask Josiah to help me out with this. <laughs> so if you can come up on stage. All right. How you doing? Good. <laughs> All right. So before I give this to you, just a normal pencil. I'm going to ask Josiah to break this pencil. Hopefully it's not like some high quality pencil. I got it from a Dollar General yesterday. So it does say ever strong on it. So we'll see. So I want you to break this pencil in half. Too easy. Good. Now I'm going to take that. Now you have two pencils for school, okay? Don't break this one yet. So now I gave a couple of pencils to, I think, five different people in the church. If I gave you pencils, can you raise your hand? Nice and high so Josiah can see it. Now go ahead and collect them. I see one over there. These pencils came sharpened, so be careful. <laughs> hey, let him pick where he goes to lunch today, okay? All right. So now, how many pencils do we have? All right. So we have about nine, ten pencils there. Now I want you to make sure they're all lined up. Hey, let's stand here so everyone can see. So we saw how easy it was for him to break that one pencil, right? As evidenced here. Now I want you to put them all together, and I want you to try to break it. If you break it, this might ruin my lesson. All right, clearly it's very difficult, right? All right, thank you. You can go ahead and have a seat. I'll give this to you later, okay? Don't say I don't care about the children. So pretty clear lesson there. Nothing too profound or anything. But the point being, when he had one pencil, he broke it very, very easily. Well, all of a sudden, when he collected pencils from multiple people in the community, in the congregation, it bared the weight of all those pencils together. So whenever I uh, was preparing for this message, it made me think of a story from when I was 
maybe sixth grade or so. I don't know about all the kids now, but uh, every school year I would get like one new pair of shoes. And so that would be my pair of shoes for the whole year. And so I could not get those dirty. And I always like getting white shoes. I still kind of do now. But anyways, I got these nice pair of white shoes. I mean, maybe not nice. They're probably in the clearance section. But I got these nice pair of white shoes. And the school year had started. And you better believe, anytime I got one little scuff on them, I made sure to clean it immediately, right? And so if I, if I stepped somewhere or someone stepped on my shoe, I would go home immediately. Or if I had the opportunity there, I'd grab some sanitizer, clean it off, make sure it was white again. So then... I'm not gonna say the name of this person, but he had just come from India, um, and that doesn't mean anything, but he had just come from India, and maybe he thought, um, you know, shoes are meant to be worn, they're meant to get dirty, so who cares? So he stepped in mud and then stepped on my white shoes, and you better believe I was, I was livid. I was like, how could you do that? You see how clean I keep them all the time. And he was like, what, they're just shoes? Like, it's fine. So you better believe, I went home, I tried to scrub it, and then what happened? There was still some mud left on there. No matter how much I cleaned it, there was still a lot of mud left on there. And that's when I was thinking, when I was preparing this message, we often do the same exact thing with sin. We feel so dirty when we first sin, and what's the first thing we do? We repent. And then we do it again, and then we feel so dirty, and then we repent. And we feel terrible, we repent, and the cycle continues until eventually we start to get numb to it and then we stop caring. So just with my shoes, my bar for keeping the shoes clean was all the way up here. Then all of a sudden when I realized, this is too much work, I can't do it anymore. They're so dirty, I'm I'm just gonna keep them dirty. All of a sudden my bar for keeping my shoes clean went all the way down to here. And it's the same thing for us when we sin. We, We have this high bar, this high expectation for ourselves as God's temple, and then all of a sudden we do this sin and we start to justify it, and our bar goes down here. And we do it again, and then our friend calls us out, and we're like, ah, I'm tired of them doing that to me. Whatever, bar goes down here. And then it keeps going lower and lower. And that's a scary place to be when you stop caring about your sin. And it made me think of this passage from Romans 1.24, and it's uh, Paul comparing the righteous versus the unrighteous. And it says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts. And this is a verse that a couple of us have talked about quite a bit. But man, that is a scary verse. I don't know if that scares you guys. But when I read that, that's scary. The fact that God gave them up to the filthiness of their heart. And... A quote that I saw from an article, I kind of tweaked it a little bit, but it says this, the spirit's restraint of sin is a blessing, but if that restraint is removed, wickedness runs free. So just as Paul was urging the Galatians to bear one another's burdens and uplift one another, church, are we not called to do the same thing? as we battle through sin and all the different obstacles that we face every single day. This is why we are in desperate need of Christ and why we are called to love one another as brothers and sisters as a Christ-centered community. And just like that pencil, he, he put pressure on it and it withstood for a little bit, but then it only takes so much for that one pencil to break. And we try to handle it on our own. We say, I can't keep getting so angry. I can't keep watching that TV show, I can't keep comparing myself, I can't keep doing this, it's all about me, 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 I, I, I. When Christ is calling us to bear one another's burdens, to have community, to, to do life with one another and stop doing it by ourselves. So as we go back into Galatians 6, it says, brothers, if anyone is caught. So when I was looking at some of the Greek translation, when it says the word caught, it's, it's saying, being overtaken as if running away from sin. So it's like you're, you're running in a race or you're just, you know, Reuben Simon, you're practicing marathon or practicing for a marathon, running 50 miles a day like Captain America. Running, 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 and then all of a sudden, it, someone overtakes you. That's kind of how it's, it's being uh, explained here as far as being caught or to be caught off guard or um, 
when you're most vulnerable. So this verse is not talking about the sinner who is willfully sinning and trying to avoid a way out, but this is referring to the sinner who simply messed up and found themselves in a place where they didn't expect to. So it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So it doesn't say you who are close to that person, which that's important too. It doesn't say you who are caring beyond all degree, that's important too. But it says you who are spiritual. So there's this spiritual prerequisite that is required before you start to help that person. And it's the same concept that, I don't know, I've all, I, we've all heard this when we've gone on a plane, but what do they tell you with, with the oxygen mask whenever they're going through that whole lesson that no one pays attention to, pays attention to anywhere? Put yours on first. So put your own mask, and this is every single plane, every single airline, they have the same rule for this. Put your own mask on first before helping others. And why is that? Because you're no use to someone else if you are already dead. It's like a blind man leading another blind man. And what does that result in? Both of them falling in a pit. And that's why the spiritual prerequisite is so important. Because we still need to keep watch, as we're going to read later on in this verse. But we still need to keep watch. Because imagine if you're not spiritual... Imagine how much more scary that is. But even with the person being spiritual here, it's still saying, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And so the word restore here, in the original meaning, it says to restore to its former condition. And it's also the same word it talks about in the Gospels when it's talking about the, uh, the disciples mending their nets. So restoring it to its former conditions, or even I believe uh, doctors would use this word uh, when talking about setting a bone back in its place after uh, an arm was broken or whatever it might be. And so often we have struggled with this as a church, and not just this church, I'm talking about the universal church, and I know I've struggled with it too, but when we catch a brother in sin or whatever it might be, we either pretend it never happened to avoid the confrontation, so this end of it, or we blow up and push that person farther away from community. And in our flesh, it's our instinct to to wanna gossip, it's our instinct to to wanna judge their sin, but it says, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of wrath. No. In a spirit of gentleness. So legalism was running rampant among the Galatians, as I had mentioned earlier. And I had one more quote that I wanted to read that I feel like really summed this up well, but it says, nothing reveals the wickedness of legalism better than the way the legalists treat those who have sinned. Let me read that one more time. Nothing reveals the wickedness of legalism better than the way the legalists treat those who have sinned. That's a good one. So should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. It was to keep going. It says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so again, this is a big part of the spiritual prerequisite, right? It's easy for us to try to help someone else be accountable, but then if we're not being careful ourselves, we're gonna fall. Maybe not the same exact sin, but we're gonna fall to sin. And it's almost like we're giving the enemy a two-for-one sale. We're making it too easy on him. And this is where I see a lot of young people, including myself at one point, go wrong. You know, you are a friend, you struggle with sin, you seek accountability, but then there's nothing past that. And when we hear the word accountability, it sounds really good, but then we have to remember that the world uses this word too, accountable. Whether it's, hey, did you practice your your shots for basketball today? Holding you accountable. Hey, did you do your homework? I'm holding you accountable. Did you finish that chapter in a book? Whatever it might be, I'm holding you accountable. And so that's why, again, I know I did this a lot and I'm seeing a lot of young people do this too, but it's this, it's this little thing where we, 
We seek that accountability and we kind of leave it at that. I messed up. Oh man, it's all right. Props for being vulnerable though. And then it stops there. And so it seems good in our flesh because it seems like, hey, I'm telling someone about what I'm doing, but we have to go deeper than that. We must go deeper than accountability. We have to seek Christ-centered community. We have to seek Christ-centered discipleship, Christ-centered mentorship. We have to find a place where trust is established, but also there's interceding happening and there's a pointing back to Christ. Why, you might ask? Because accountability without any spiritual response is just a vain confession. And in the past couple of years, I know like we've had all this like mental health awareness movements and everything, and that's, that's fantastic. I do believe that you know, we should be talking about what burdens us the most and sharing with our brothers and sisters. And I believe that that has become a big reason as to why our youth have become so vulnerable because I, I mean, I know for sure, like when I was younger, it was maybe happening a tiny bit, but then now I feel like more and more youth are like sharing some deep and dark secrets and that's, that's great. So youth are becoming more vulnerable and then we find it, but sorry, but then we find it hard to seek like-minded community. So we tend to stay too practical and we neglect the intercession portion of bearing one another's burdens. Because with bearing one another's burdens, comes a Christ-like love that leads us to pray for them as if it's our own burden, right? So that was the youth section of it. I'm gonna jump to the adult section of it for that portion. What I have noticed so far is that I've, I find that adults are interceding so great and I feel like the adults have honed in on a spiritual side of things that the youth are still kind of working themselves up to, but what I'm seeing lacking is like the adults are not being vulnerable and transparent. And it's because of fear of judgment. And I'm not saying that in a condemning way, I'm saying that to show the, the, the big difference with the youth and with the adults right now. And I think both sides can really learn from each other. The youth can press in more and pray together. You know, not just 90%, I did this, 10%, I'm gonna pray for you but rather going into your secret place and not just praying for your own prayer request, but seeing that my friend was struggling with this today. I need to pray for him because that brother is like, I want it to be like it's my own burden. And so I do feel that both sides can really learn from each other. And that's why iron sharpening iron is so important, right? We hear that all the time, but, but when we think of iron sharpening iron, <clears throat> it's not just, it's not just, uh, holding, it's almost like you are sharpening a knife. You're not just taking the knife and, and just sharpening it like that. Both sides are pushing against each other and pushing each other to a point of growing and to, to a point of sharpening each other. So I feel like there's three different types of friend groups, and I'm just talking in this context, but I feel like there are three different types of friend groups that we have. The first friend group is they change you. So your friend group is negative, negatively impacting you. I think there's a second friend group where you change them. So you're negatively impacting them. And I think there's a third friend group of iron sharpening iron. And again, just looking from this context right here, because I mean, yeah, you could say the first friend group of them changing you, that could be they're pouring into you. The second friend group, you could also say you're changing them, you're pouring into them. But I'm just looking from this context right here of finding good friend groups and finding Christ-like community. So they change you, you change them, and iron sharpening iron. Your friend group will really dictate what kind of community you're seeking. That tells a lot about your character. And I think it's so crazy when the Bible says a lot about community and um, it talks about you know bad company will spoil morals and it talks about so much about who we're with and how that impacts us. But when, I think it's, it's, it's amazing when scripture says that and then the world copies it too, but they won't quote scripture. Because the world talks about that a whole lot too. I can't think of any quotes right now, but I mean, I'm sure you guys can think of so many times where people will say like, oh, that person's dragging you down. Don't hang out with them. 
or that, that group is holding back your potential. Don't hang out with them. So where do we find that group that will sharpen us? 2 Timothy 2, 22. If someone could read that out loud for me. 2 Timothy 2, verses 22. Second Timothy two twenty two. With them, or my ESV says, along. So flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I feel like a lot of us, we may know this verse, but we focus so much on flee youthful passions. Yes, that's good. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Yes, that's good. But along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This, this verse is telling us to seek community. Do it along with those who are in the same boat as you, who are on the same journey towards Christ as you. And it's easy to hear this and disregard everything and believe that your friend group is fine and it's the best thing for you, and to believe that they don't need to be building you up, and that you can do it by yourself. But believe it or not, scripture says a lot about being by yourself a lot too. First Peter 5, 8 says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, singular. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So as he's looking around, walking around, looking for who he can devour, he's looking for the weak and the injured. He's looking for the proud who feel like they can do it by themselves. He's looking for the loner. I don't know if you guys ever watched any, uh, uh, what is it, Animal Planet? Is that the right channel? I don't know. Anyways, if you guys have ever watched any of those channels where it's, it's showing animals in the wild and you don't often see lions, I mean, sometimes you do, but you don't often see lions just running into a big group. They're kind of prowling around. And again, when you hear the word prowl, I'm thinking, you know, there's the grass and you're kind of hiding and you're going nice and slow waiting to see if you can sneak up on one of them and catch them off guard, which again is what it kind of talks about in the very beginning being caught in a transgression, when you're vulnerable, when you're caught off guard. And it made me think too, this is probably the most Oklahoma thing we'll hear today in a message, but have you ever wondered when you're driving by a field and you see all the cows, cows huddled up together? Has anyone seen that? Even when it's super hot outside too, I always wonder, I, I used to wonder before I looked it up at least, but I wondered like, it's 100 degrees outside and why are some of these cows all huddled up together? Because that would just make, it more hot, it would make the temperatures rise even more. And there's a few reasons, but one of the biggest ones is it's a natural instinct to protect each other from the predators. And they're not just huddled in a circle with their butts out, their heads are all facing out on the outside of the circle. So it's, it's like we see this in creation, we see this, this group instinct for everyone to stick together, all this creation, and yet, why are we neglecting it so often? So again, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so when it says burdens here in verse two, it's referring to heavy burdens that are more than someone should carry. And it almost sounds like these two verses don't match up when it says verse two, and then you look at verse five, it says bear one another's burdens but then verse five says, each will have to bear his own load. So it sounds like it's counterintuitive, but it's not because bear one another's burdens, that word is saying more than someone should have to carry. Whereas Galatians 6, five, each will have to bear his own load. That word load is, was a common term for backpack. So we are all carrying, carrying our own backpack. That doesn't mean we shouldn't help someone else whose burden has become too much. 
So bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? I'm gonna read a few verses that explains what the law of Christ is. It's a couple different passages. Listen really close, because you might miss it. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's try another one. Romans 13, eight. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. In case anyone's not getting it yet. James 2, verses eight. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. One more. John 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So how do we show that love, church? By bearing one another's burdens. To love your brother, to love your sister as you love yourself. And it's so hard, but this is when I wanna go into the, the interceding section. Because so often our prayers are focused on ourselves. I know for me, my, my, prayer, my prayer walk started as my, maybe the first couple years when, I, when we did family prayer and this would be my prayer. Lord, bless mom and dad, bless, bless Sharon, bless, uh, bless uh, New York family, bless India family, bless, bless Dallas family. And so that would be me interceding for them. And then as I got older, then it started to get more specific, but then it became more me focused. Lord, help me on my test. Help me in A, B, or C, whatever it might be. And now, no, it doesn't mean I have it all together. Of course not. But I'm starting to realize how important it is to intercede and pray for the, the whole church, not just ourselves. And so often our prayers are focused on ourselves, but to bear our brother or sister's burden as our own, that means we have to pray for them with the same urgency as we would ourselves. That's, that's a lot. We're so selfish as humans, aren't we? So to pray for someone else's burden means you either understand it because you've gone through it, which is one level, but to never go through that other person's burden, but to pray for that in the same urgency as if it's your own, that is Christ's love. And so, right after it talks about what we uh, mentioned in verse 1 Peter, it talks about the devil prowling around like a roaring lion. It says, right after that, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So it's not just you facing it, but rather all the brothers and sisters throughout the world are facing sin. So if we understand that those around us, a part of the same body, are going through the same kinds of suffering or the same kinds of attacks of the enemy, how much more should we be interceding for one another? 1 Corinthians 12 says, God composed the body that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So if my brother is suffering, then I too am suffering. I must lift him up in prayer that we may rejoice together. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And that reminded me of how often, whether there's a big meeting coming up or a message or whatever it might be, and then... So often, we're supposed to be praying for that person or whatever it might be, and then you kind of think, ah, someone else will take care of the prayer. Someone else will take care of the prayer aspect. Or the, I know the youth sometimes think, oh, the, the adults will focus more on the prayer. We'll focus more on the worship or whatever it might be. I'm saying this because I thought this before too. And we get stuck in the bystander effect in prayer. Does anyone know what the bystander effect is? Essentially, if you see someone needing help or someone just got mugged, or someone just got their 
their stuff stolen from them or they got hurt. Instead of wanting to help, the bystander effect means that you see all the other people around you and you assume someone else is gonna help them. And we do that in prayer too, our, our, our bystander effect in prayer. And when I was thinking about this, I had this conviction that our persecuted brothers and sisters across the world are interceding for us. Does that make sense? I just had this like heavy feeling in my spirit that brothers and sisters who are going through much tougher things than us, they're interceding for us. Are we doing the same for them? So I really had to challenge myself in my prayer this week. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor for each will have to bear his own load. So it's essentially saying don't boast because you compared yourself to someone else's sin. There will be a day of judgment when you'll be judged according to the works you did. So stop comparing yourself. So as I'm ending here, I just wanna end with a couple more points, but loving one another comes with the territory of loving Christ. We can't treat loving others as some extra credit or some bonus opportunity. It's, it's expected to love our neighbor. And as I said before, there's gonna come a day where we are all judged according to our works on this earth. And my plea to whoever needed to hear this message is stop doing it alone. God is not alone. Since the beginning, he had communion with the Son and the Spirit. Jesus was never alone. He taught the disciples what it truly means to do life together. And he himself had his own inner circle. And the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are never alone through the word of God and through the body, which is one through him. So I thank God that more and more mentorship, more and more discipleship, more and more community is beginning to form. And this is not a plug or anything, but we're God willing, we wanna start discipleship groups. And again, this is not a plug. I, this message came to me in the middle of the night, like a month or two months ago. But the point being, and John Verghese's pastor mentioned this earlier this week, but we've had so many deaths in this church recently. And it's been tough, but it's also in the, in the time of these hardships, that's when we see everyone come together more, right? My prayer is that we may have the same love and care for each other at all times, that we may bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. May his name be glorified. Can we all just stand for worship? Can we all take a moment?